So welcome everyone to this meeting of the Meritus College uh, Travel Group. And I just want to start by acknowledging that I live in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, today, Nancy Langton is going to uh, give us a talk about her experience in Namibia, as you see on the slide, from March of 2024. Before I hand over to Nancy, I'm going to ask everyone to mute your microphone so we don't get any feedback that is unnecessary. And I'll just go now directly to Nancy. Nancy, perhaps you could introduce yourself um, and then get going with your presentation. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm Nancy Langton. I'm retired from the Sutter School of Business. And this is a tale of my trip to Namibia in March 2024. I traveled with um, a group of, called Within the Frame, who organized most of the trips that you've heard me talk about before. And some of the people who are on this trip uh, with me are here on this Zoom today, which is making me extremely nervous. Um, but that's okay, I did invite them. And um, what I'll try to do is give you sort of an overview of this trip there were eight participants and two driver guides. We were, in, we were spread across two vehicles. And I think all of us agreed that this was one of the best trips we'd all taken. Um, everybody got along, which was just fantastic. Um, so let me uh, get started by showing you a map of Namibia. And um, just to give you a sense of where Namibia is, you can see that South Africa is um, below it, Botswana is beside it, Angola is above it. Um, and so, and it is on the coast here. So the trip started in Windhoek, which is the capital of um, Namibia. And th there were three parts to this trip and I took two parts of the trip. So the first part of the trip was Windhoek um, to skeleton, um, to the skeleton coast. Um, and so we went from Windhoek to Swakamund, which is where we stayed um, on the Skeleton Coast. And we did some journeying and adventuring uh, along Walvis Bay and, and Henley's Bay. And I probably won't make a distinction between these two bays. I'll just talk about some of the things that we saw. So we stayed there um, for uh, three nights. And then we went back to Windhoek. And um, then we met up with the, some more of our group who were coming with us. And then from Windhoek, we set off, um, I'm not ever going to pronounce these things right, Otiwarongo, um, and then to Ukjo. What we were doing during this time, and, and I'll give you more details in a bit, but we were really just kind of, when I say killing time, this is a long drive. Um, we were trying to get up here. And so we had to kind of make our way over several um, days to get here. And then um, we ended up in this area, which is um, near um, Etupa Falls. And it's also right where we were staying was on the, um, almost on the border of Angola, like you could practically yeah. touch Angola. And we visited some tribes there. And then we started coming south um, again. And of course, um, by this time we had moved west some. So we started coming south, um, had some journeys here, and then we ended up in Windhoek again. Um, and then another part of the group, not um, not me, but some of the group went off and did several days of spa days actually, um, which I didn't, um, I just wasn't able to do. Anyway, when I tried to put this talk together today, we saw so many different things and I kept detailed lists of everything we saw every day from every animal to every tree to every flower to, and when I tried to put this together today, it's like, well, there's no way I can show you all of that. So we had to kind of pick and choose um, what um, I, I could show you. And I particularly wanted to focus 
on the different tribes that we saw. So that's what you'll see mostly um, in the photos. And if we get to the end and there's still time, I do have some photos of the places where we stayed and I do have um, some photos of some of the food. So we'll just kind of see how those things go. So let me tell you just a little bit about Namibia and my trip um, before we get started. So first of all, this trip covered um, from the time I started in Windhoek and then um, we went to the Skeleton Coast and then up around and then back, that was 3,614 kilometers round trip. Um, so it was quite a long trip. And the temperatures varied from about 10 degrees centigrade to 43 degrees centigrade. Um, and every once in a while, my watch um, could keep the temperature. And every once in a while, somebody in our vehicle would take photos of my watch to prove what the temperature was um, because it was so hot some days. Um, and just one other um, bunch of little tidbits before I get started. But um, Namibian dollars are worth eight cents Canadian um, or six cents U.S., and that will become relevant. I have a menu of um, from one of the restaurants just to, so that you can see that later. So let me give you a little bit about the history. Um, 25,000 BC, um, where the uh, is thought to be um, the first humans lived in um, the south of Namibia. And these would have been the San and Damara tribes. Um, and you'll see a little bit about them later in this talk. The, country in, in terms of what it looks like is is quite prehistoric in some ways quite modern in, in other ways um and so you've got ageless land ageless land with rock art petrified forests boulders dunes and i'll try to show you um some of that it's a fairly large country in the sense that it's twice the size of california but there's only 2 million people. So it's the second lowest population density in the world. And a lot of where we traveled, there were no people in between some of those places at all. Um, so it's it's not very populated. Um, a little bit of its pre-colonial history. In 1805, um, British missionaries arrived. And then in 1840s, um, the Germans arrived. And so then until um, till about 1894, so between 1840 and 1894, the British and the Germans were kind of battling over uh, who was going to control Namibia. So that was um, kind of interesting. And in 1894, it became a German colony um, and was a German colony through World War I. Um, at, at the end of World War I, the League of Nations gave... Um, Namibia to South Africa uh, to administer, which they did um, until about uh, 1946. And the, the League of Nations was dissolved and the UN then tried to adjust this. And so the UN tried to take um, Namibia away from South Africa between 1946 and 1996, um, sorry, 1966. So during those 20 years, South Africa kept saying the people of Namibia want to be with us. And the UN was like, We're, we need to separate you. Um, and so um, in 1966, Namibia became uh, the responsibility of the UN, but South Africa really kept its hands in um, throughout. And then in 1997, uh, a, a group that um, was composed of Canada, the US, France, the UK, and Germany worked on a settlement proposal for independence, which finally, so that was 1997, um, March 21st, 1990 was Independence Day. Um, and now it's a multi-party democracy, something the US may no longer be, but anyway, we'll not worry about that for now. Okay. So this is Swakamund, um, which is a a German colony. So this is at the Skeleton Coast. We've gone from Windhoek to the Skeleton Coast. Swakopmund was founded in 1892, um, and it was the main harbor for the Imperial German <laughs> colony. Um, and it's very German in its look and feel. And you'll note the street is like totally empty. Um, we arrived there on a Sunday, and on Sunday, everything is closed. Absolutely everything is closed. Um, we saw it on later days when there was traffic all over. Um, just another um, a home in Swakamund, just to give you just 
a little sense of the architecture there, very Germanic, very structured. Um, and then, as I said, it is on the coast. And so um, we could walk to um, the ocean from where we were staying. And, and this was just a little part of our walk. Um, so that gives you a, a little notion of Swakamund. Okay, so we stayed in Swakamund, as I said, for three nights and we um, journeyed to the Skeleton Coast um, from there, which wasn't that far, um, over three days. And so I'll now show you some of the things that we saw on the Skeleton Coast. So this, um, one of the things to know about the Skeleton Coast is it's a rough seas, um, very windy, strong ocean currents. And so there have been a number of shipwrecks uh, along that coast, and that's why it's called the Skeleton Coast. And um, this particular ship is called the Zilla, and it sunk on August 25th, 2008. And it's a fishing trawler. Um, that was based in Walvis Wal Bay, which is along the coast. And it had been, this is kind of funny when, it, when I heard it at the time, um, it was sold to India as scrap metal. Um, and so it, it had been based in Walvis Bay. And so they were towing it to India. And I remember standing, looking at it, thinking, I don't know if I remember where India is right at this moment in time because I'm so map challenged. I'm thinking uh, that doesn't seem like a good idea. And sure enough, I think within a day or so, it, or so, it was um, not able to uh, travel anymore, and it um, it just sits there now. And so um, I took, as you can imagine, a bunch of photos. You won't be able to see some of my direct rust photos, which I often show. You'll have to use these boats as my rust photos. Okay. And here's a, so you saw the front view and now a side view so that you can have an understanding and how they were going to tow this to India anyway. Like, I think the idea was ridiculous personally, but what do I know? Okay, so in Walvis Bay, this is um, um, seals. This is one of the largest Cape fur seal colonies along the coast of Namibia. Um, and it's it's in the hundreds of thousands. The numbers I've seen range from 100,000 to 200,000, and they were just like all over the place. It was really interesting um, to watch them. This is Cape Cross. And um, so th this was kind of interesting to me. In 1485, um, the King of Portugal suggested to one of his explorers that uh, he needed to go off and explore and wanted to, him to explore along the African coast. And so in, 18, in 1486, so the next year, the explorer got to uh, this coast, um, which is now called Cape Cross. And the king had told him to plant crosses to kind of mark the Portuguese territory. And so he did plant a cross um, in 1846. Um, the Germans came along in 1893 and took the cross um, that was planted and took it to Berlin. Um, and it's actually now in a museum in Berlin. And so in, so then for all this time, all that time from 1893, there weren't any crosses there. And then in the late 20th century, um, donors came by and donated money to build sort of a replica of a cross. And then the second cross, which I think is the one on the left, uh, was built several years later, contributed several years later. And it was thought to, to more reflect what the first cross looked like. So there were just two competing crosses sitting there to mark that space. Um, okay, so um, then on another day, sort of in the same area, we went and um, saw flamingos. And I want you to start to get a sense of the terrain in Namibia. I mean, it's so different in all kinds of areas. We're on the coast here, um, but you can kind of see the shoreline and, and you can see um, out into the ocean. And um, there were quite a lot of pink flamingos um, there, which, which were really quite interesting to see. Later that same day, um, we went to see the dunes, and the dunes are really uh, quite surreal. And we we drove on the dunes on several different days, but one day we spent several hours in um, like four by four vehicles, not the vehicles we were in, but lighter vehicles, because our vehicles would have been way too heavy. Um, and we just were driving all over the, the dunes, um, and the drivers, I was sitting in the front because I get car sick, but 
um, th th it was frightening and sometimes because we'd come to the top of the dune and you couldn't see anything and then the car would plunge down. Um, and at one time we had, I think we had two vehicles and the two vehicles um, went down together and you could see the rush of the sand um, going. It was, it was really um, quite amazing um, to see the dunes. I think there might be some other pictures. Here is one more photo of the dune right now, just to give you a sense of the size of it. Um, this is our fearless leader, Jeffrey, um, doing his own photography while I'm photo photographing him. Okay, um, this is another shipwreck um, that we saw. This is called, um, this name was named the Shawnee, and it was a transport tug that ran aground apparently under mysterious circumstances, and I haven't found out what the mysterious circumstances were. And this happened in February 6, 1976. Um, and so that sits there and birds and other uh, marine life sort of inhabit parts of the ship. And it would have been possible, because um, I don't think it was that deep to walk out to that, but nobody um, took that out when we were there. One of the um, nice things that we did in, in uh, on this day, so after we drove all over the dunes and then we came to see this ship, we then had a picnic um, on the, the beach and just a, a lovely um, picnic um, with really well-prepared food. We were, were very well fed on this trip and I'll talk about that some later if we, if we still have time um, to do that. So that gives you a small sense of Skeleton Coast. Um, the idea was to see these shipwrecks. We didn't get to see the third shipwreck because um, one of the days uh, the, the tide was really coming in quickly and um, we were driving right along um, almost the water and the water actually hit our vehicle. Our vehicle was in front um, and right away our driver signaled to the driver behind us to get off um, where he was going and detour somewhere else and then we had to carefully uh, also um, get off the water so that we didn't go into the water. Um, it was quite the adventure in any event. So from there, we went back um, to Windhoek, picked up some more fellow travelers, and now we're starting to head um, north. And um, the first place that we go to is OT OTG Barango. Um, and the, it took us a fair amount of the day to get there. And so we did a game drive um, that afternoon. And I've done a lot of safaris. And so I wasn't really interested in, in taking that many photos. And I didn't take very many photos. Um, but what I did do for a group, because we had a checkoff list, I wrote down the names of, or I checked off the names of every animal that we saw on that safari on that day. And we saw quite a bit of them. But I love giraffes. And so um, I did take a photo of a giraffe to kind of um, remember that uh, particular adventure. The next day in this area, we went into a village um, where there were Herero women. And um, we just, um, this is the village that was mostly populated by Herero people. Um, and they are um, cattle farmers. And cattle is really what their, is how they signal their wealth. And so um, these are the, the clothing that they wear. So this is not a a, a costume. Um, it is actually the clothing that the Herrera women wear. It's kind of mid 1800s Victorian dresses. And you'll see these hats, um, they're horn shaped hats. And those are meant to sort of um, commemorate, recognize the importance of the cows. Um, so one of the members of our group stopped this woman and had her pose against the wall. She was so patient, she let us each take um, photos of her um, while she nicely smiled at us. Um, and this next photo was not taken in that village, but I just thought I'd show you one more Herrera woman. Um, you can see her, her clothing is um, quite shiny and orange, and her hat is quite different. In the village that we were in, all of the women that I remember, their hats match their outfits. But in this particular place where we stopped, which is way later in the trip, um, their hats didn't match their dresses. I don't know if there's any significance to that or not. Okay, so we're continuing our drive. And some of these photos are just to give you a sense of the kinds of roads that we drove in and what we saw. And so um, there were certainly paved roads in Windhoek um, and a little bit 
in Swakamund, but as soon as you got outside of the city areas, you were driving on gravel or worse. Um, and you, you you can see all kinds of green. It was, it was very green there. Another really interesting thing about driving along these roads was that you'd often see animals, zebras, giraffes, um, all kinds of elk things. Um, just kind of, we didn't, I guess there were signs about crossings. I don't remember seeing any actually cross in front of our vehicle. I'm not going to say that didn't happen, um, but you would see them on the side of the road. And so quite different than, say, being in a safari where things are quite planned. These are wandering um, in these large um, areas. So we stopped uh, along the road at one point and we ran into, um, these are uh, three boys from the Himba tribe. And um, we just stopped by to look at people, talk to them. And um, the boys uh, are responsible for helping herd the cattle. So that's what um, they were doing. I will mention, because this could come up, we always ask, in our group, we always ask people if we can take their photos. And if they say no, we don't take their photos. So um, they're well aware that we're taking their photos. This is a Himba women, a, um, a Himba woman. And uh, you'll see some more of these women. Um, this is kind of a portrait. And you'll note, um, well, several different things. You'll note, these are all cow tails at the end of uh, her braids. Um, and then these are these, these braids. And the, what they do with the braids, and, and you'll see um, in another photo, this actually happening, but they rub kind of an ochre and a butterfat thing into their braids. Um, and, and they just um, keep staying like that. This big necklace that you see, um, that, that signifies, and I never did look this up, so I don't know the answer. If um, a young woman, a woman is wearing one of these big fat necklaces, it means that her father is still alive. Um, so then we um, stopped at another village, and in this village, actually, we, we got out of the car because there was cows all over the place, and we thought that was interesting. We didn't see any people. We just saw tons of cows, and the next thing you know, people just descended upon us, and it was really nice because we just wandered around, and we talked to these people um, and, uh, you know, what they were doing, and then at one point, they wanted us, I don't think I caught on why, but they wanted us to go down to the water, and then they posed in the water um, with us. You'll notice that they wear... Um, all kinds of beads and also uh, iron um, jewelry. Um, and the beads are made from ostrich shells. And you'll see a little bit of that later, but um, they wear a lot of jewelry. And this kind of stuff that's on their skin is this okra stuff, um, the, the okra and butter that they rub on their skins. And that's the skin protection from um, sun. This was at Upupa Falls, so now we're um, up near Angola, and there are apparently big drop-offs of the falls, but I don't think we were in a place to see the biggest drop-offs, or at least I wasn't. Um, and this was a woman who was stopping to get um, some water. And I've noticed in a, a lot of the photos of African women that I've taken, when they're doing chores like this, they have that really interesting, they can bend their bodies you know, like they're very straight and then and then they curve down um and that's just fascinating she mean you see she took off her shoes um before she went into the water another part of the falls um and you can see this is kind of a minor part of the falls so the falls sit on the edge of angola and um namibia and they have a different name on the Angolan side. I don't remember um, the, that name, but it's the Pupa Falls on um, the Namibian side. And, th and this is part of the falls area um, at sunset one evening. We went up um, on top of a hill and we had literally sundowners. We had um, gin and tonics and watched the sun set. We had gin and tonics, I think, every night that we were there, maybe twice a night. Okay, this is um, one of the villages in that area. So remember I said we like, were driving all the way north. We were trying to get to see these villages. So um, we went to, uh, we stopped at one of these villages and you'll see um, this woman is, is milking a cow and this guy is um, also milking a cow. One of the things that we learned was that for the most part, it's the women who milk the cows um, and it's the men who herd the cows. Um, and 
in in this village or the next one, I don't remember. We, when we arrived, um, we were, arrived early, and and the women, um, were, I mean, they weren't upset by it, but they they didn't feel like they were properly attired for, um, for us to see them, and so they all went back to their little huts and things to get properly attired to meet with us. Um, and so then the men were milking the cows because it was time to milk the cows. Um, this is to give you a sense. So this is the same village that that woman was in. Um, they're little, they're just little huts. They keep fires burning inside, not big fires, um, to keep out the insects um, and and bugs and things. And they're very um, modest in style. And uh, I think this next photo. So this is the inside of that, and you'll see there's not very much in there. They do sleep. Um, in there, but they don't have many belongings. This is where the fire would be, and um, they hang some of their belongings on the walls here. So again, I just wanted to give you a sense of what that looked like. This is in that same um, village. Uh, this is a different kind of hut, and this woman was just sitting there, um, and she was letting me take her photo, and, and she posed really nicely um, for me. And, and so you can see the simplicity um, of of these arrangements, it's it's very hot there. Um, and so I think, you know, that has something to do with it. Also, these people are no, semi-nomadic. And so they may move several times a year. Um, this was just to give you a sense of village life. So this was uh, kind of in the morning and um, just women and children sitting around and, and chatting. Um, they were a little bit when I say disturb bias, I mean, we were all around taking photos of them and, and looking at them. And um, they were all fine with that. And I'll explain uh, how that worked in a Look moment. Look at this, Heiko. Is, sorry? Um, it's, you'll notice they have um, these chain link things uh, on their legs, um, also with beads, just again, all kinds of adornments um, that they're wearing. Mute the mic. Oh, mute the mic. Thank you. Okay, so this is um, the same village. And now what's happening is that um, the women and girls are laying out blankets so that they can um, sell us some of their wares. So what happened when we went to these villages, and I really appreciated it a lot, um, was our guides would explain to them, and it was understood that we wanted to see village life in all its forms and kind of figure out what was going on and talk to them as best we could. Um, not everyone spoke English. Often the um, younger people did speak some chunk of English, and there were always some English speakers. Um, but the idea was we could wander around and take photos. If somebody told us we couldn't take their photo, you didn't. I don't remember anyone ever saying no that I couldn't take their photo. I'm not going to say it didn't happen, but I don't remember it happening to me. Um, and then the idea would be that they would put out the things that they sold, um, bracelets, necklaces, um, little statues, and all kinds of other things. And the understanding was, in exchange for these photos, we would buy some of their goods. And... Um, we were told by our guides to make sure that we all didn't go to the same blanket. Like we were supposed to spread ourselves around and um, make sure that everyone got a little bit of money um, in this situation. And so it worked out really nicely because I've been in other situations where, um, I mean, I understand it, but people are trying to sell you things all the time and you can't really take photos if that's what you want to do um, in any real way, because it's it's just really about they're trying to just sell you things. So I really liked this arrangement a lot better. Um, I think it worked better um, for everyone. And they were really, as I said, very calm about us taking photos um, because they understood that we would purchase things from them afterwards. Um, so this is another village now. So this village we went to really early in the morning. Um, I think we left at six or something, got there by seven, because we were going to have about a nine hour drive that day. And so um, we wanted to get this done. But um, our, our leaders had been to this village um, seven years prior or something like that. And they wanted to go back and see how the village was doing. And we actually brought them um, some food, some maize and some sugar and some flour, things that they would want and they would use. And, and that was part of our contribution to their village. So this is early in the morning. The cows are kind of hanging out. They haven't been um, taken out to pasture yet. 
Okay, so this is um, one of the women, you'll see her again later. She's showing us how she um, puts stuff into her hair um, in order to keep it clean. These women, um, the women do not bathe. Um, and I, I don't think I got a satisfactory answer for exactly why that was the case. It just was the case. And instead, they smear this ochre, red ochre butter stuff all over their skin. And that's kind of how they bathe themselves. And our, one of our guides had warned us several times that um, this might have a smell. Um, they use Mopani leaves um, as ground up as a sort of uh, perfume for this. I I have to say, and I I remember all of us saying, we didn't really notice any smell. And of course, we were all so sweaty from it being so hot. Like, uh, who were we to talk about somebody else smelling bad? Um, we didn't notice it. And as I said, we probably smell, smelled bad too. But she's showing us how um, she handles her hair. This just um, photo of one of the huts in the village. This is one of the nicer ones. Um, there were two young girls um, sitting back there. I think they were hiding from the crowd, um, but I did go over and talk to them um, for a little while and their English was just perfect. I would say they were hmm, maybe 13, 14. I mean, they weren't very old. Uh, another uh, cabin or whatever you want to call it um, in the same village, um, you know, when I was talking village, I don't remember the sizes, but, you know, we're probably not talking more than 75 people, if even that. Um, and so here you can see that they're, um, it's fenced in some, I think that has to do with just keeping the cows out of the house. Um, and then they have things drying on the, the stakes around it. This was a, a young girl standing outside of um, one of the, the huts there. And um, I should mention um, I should have mentioned that earlier as well. Um, so you see her hairstyle. She's got this kind of thing coming over her face and it, it can fall anyway. Um, this signifies that she's um, not uh, not had her first period. Uh, that's the easiest way to say it. Um, so you've got the two things. So they wear their hair like this until they have their first period and then they, they start to go into the braids. And, and I don't know exactly how that works, but that's kind of the significance um, of those two things. And you can see here, um, she's wearing one of those large necklaces that signifies that her um, father is still alive. This was um, the village elder. And um, he we... Um, spoke with him for a little while and we presented him. This is some of the, the food that we presented him with um, to thank him for letting us um, visit their village. And um, he was just sitting there calmly. Um, but he, he, as I said, he was the elder. And there was an area in that village where we weren't allowed to walk across because that would have been violating some space. So um, that was the only thing that we had to be careful about. And so here, um, this woman is showing us um, the ochre and, and rubbing it together. And then um, she's going to smear it some on herself. And then she <laughs> offered to smear it on us a little bit. And I think most of the women did get some. I didn't want any on because I just did not want the stuff all over my clothes. Um, so that's just that's me sometimes. But um, I, I mean, it was it was kind of nice that she was willing to share that with us, how it was done. And again, you can see behind her um, some of the children and um, then some of the women. Again, they were they had set out their wares now for us to buy because it was it was getting time for us to, to leave. OK, so now we're driving south. Um, so we've gone as far north as we can go without crossing into um, Angola. So now we're starting to drive south. And again, this is just to kind of show some of the road and what the road looks like. Um, not very well paved. This goes into when I started talk, talking about some of the sort of prehistoric stuff that you see. Um, and you'll see uh, you have photos of rocks later, big giant rocks. I often... I from time to time we just comment that that this area looks so prehistoric to me and when I say that I still don't know exactly what I meant by that but there's just all these geological features that were just so interesting and so different from anything that we normally see okay this was Camp Doro um, this was a luxury camp this was a fantastic camp to stay in and um, it had six tents and um, 
you can't really see any of the tents, but this was the main kitchen area um, with another area right over here where we'd eat outside. This is where we ate breakfast. Um, and there was a bar inside and um, really well stocked. Um, and the pe the service was really great. And, and we hung out there a lot in the late evening and they had an honor system. Well, it wasn't even an honor system. Um, then a really well stocked bar and all you needed to do was write down what you took. So a glass of wine, a, a can of beer, whatever. And that was just for inventory purposes. They didn't care who had it. They just needed to know how much had been consumed so they could buy some more um, the next day. And one night um, we decided we wanted some port. And so we had this bottle of port and then we're looking at it and thinking, okay, now how do we explain like how much port that we drank? And um, so one of the the service guides was still there and he brought me a glass and he said um just count how many of these you pour so it was like okay that works um there was a washroom um over here um I didn't go in it so I don't know much about it um there was a kitchen um uh, behind here we did go into the kitchen um I don't have any photos of it but we did go into the kitchen um and there was also some internet access um, over here. There, as I said, there were six tents. My tent happened to be closest enough that I had internet access, but only two of the tents had internet access. Otherwise, you had to um, come up here to use um, the internet. But it was a really beautiful camp. Um, you can see how rocky it is. Really teeny tiny paths to get to um, the tents. Um, and, and you really kind of needed to stay on the path because of how rocky it was. We took several drives from that camp. And so um, this is one of the drives we did. So you can see um, it was a long drive into camp, a really long drive into camp. And it was really rocky and really um, bumpy and often twisty and turny. And um, we sometimes wondered how they even knew how to get to their camps because it, it was just, um, it was hard for us to see directions, but I mean, they knew what they were doing. So on this day, we went to the, Demera, Demera Cultural Center. And I mentioned to you earlier that the San and the Demera were the first known tribes in Namibia. And so we went to the Cultural Center um, and they um, were showing us what their life um, was like. And so one woman told us that she was the herbal medicine person. And so she explained to us about herbs and how they were used and for sore, for sore stomachs, for other things. Um, they showed us how they did jewelry making. Um, as I mentioned, they used the ostrich eggs for the beads. They showed us tool making um, and they showed us fire building. And then at the end, um, they did a, a dance for us. And there were both men and women. I think if I recall correctly, first the women came out dancing and then the men, and then there were men and women dancing all over. So this is just um, one photo. Notice again, different clothing from what we just saw. Same kind of area and same kinds of temperatures. People deal with them in different ways, um, which is quite interesting as well. Um, also notice, so this is like this huge rock um, that's, sort of the background um, for part of the cultural center. And then you see all these other rocks. And that's kind of what I mean when I'm saying that this looks uh, prehistoric um, to me in some ways. Um, just, it's not about the people, it's just about the rock formations and things like that. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. This is another um, drive that we were doing. Um, this is dunes. On this particular day, we were um, based from Camp Doro, but uh, we were looking for elephants. And uh, we drove around for hours looking for elephants. And um, and we had no idea how our guide, whoops, sorry. I don't know what's gonna happen. Oh, good. Um, our guides, um, there was no way, we had no sense of direction, but they were driving around and um, and at some point um, they told us to kind of get ready and they took the roof off the our vehicle um, and then there were the elephants. And so we uh, there were nine elephants in total in two groups and we were in two vehicles um, and the elephants were separated a little bit. And so one vehicle went to one set of the elephants and one vehicle went to the other set of elephants. And I think two of the elephants, I think this was one of them, were 
um, like six months old. That's why he's kind of leaning. He doesn't really have all his balance yet. But one of the elephants was just five weeks old. And our group didn't see that elephant first. And so by the time we got over to there, um, the little baby elephant, it was laying on the ground sleeping or something. So I never really did get to see myself, um, the little elephant, but none of us really minded. Some people saw it, some people didn't, um, and that was okay. Um, but it was really fun to uh, go on this sort of elephant expedition and then see the elephants. Um, and so that was really joyous. And so those are my two favorite animals, the giraffes and the elephants. So th those are the ones I take photos of. Okay, this is still at Camp Duro. This is from the porch of my tent um, where I'm sitting out watching the sunrise. Um, so again, you get a sense of what the landscape there is. is they've cleared um, land for the to set up the camp, but the camp is very environmentally friendly. And they're, this particular company is trying to um, also, gosh, just what I need. Um, they're trying also to um, set up other camps that are also environmentally friendly in that area. Okay, now we've gone south, um, and this is the sand, and the sand um, are the other uh, early tribe to Namibia, and um, so they took us around and showed us a number of things, and I just wanted to mention, so these were... These are both these are boys and girls, um, and I think a number of us, including myself, thought they were all boys at first. Um, but later uh, we realized that some of them um, were girls. And so there were two guys. There was another guy with him, and he was showing us um, the area uh, on, and showing us things. And these little children followed him around um, and anticipate they knew how the the, the tour went. Um, so here he is telling us. You can see that he's um, carrying. I think you'll see this a little bit more. He's carrying different tools that he shows us um, how to use. And the whole idea, what they're trying to show is how their grandparents and elders had um, hunted um, for animals and how they po how they killed them and how they poisoned them. And they explained about the poison and stuff. But the government has, has now outlawed the hunting. And so they can no longer have the kind of life that they once had, but they were showing us what their life was. Um, so they were showing us how they made fire. And again, you can see some of their, their weapons here. And um, they were blowing on sticks and they put them on the ground. They added more um, sticks. It was really fascinating. I've watched fire building before and I always find that really interesting um, when they do it. This was um, in that same um, village there. So these are petroglyphs um, from quite a long time ago. Um, and again, you can get a sense of how large the rocks are um, and, and, what's, um, and how ancient all of this looks. Um, this was the women and children who weren't part of the tour. They were sitting along this large um, rock wall and um, just kind of hanging out. And this woman here is um, making beads with um, the ostrich shells. And, and she was making kind of the tiniest beads and she was really good at it. And then she passed them to this woman and this woman had kind of a little pointy stick and she put like beautiful little holes in the beads. Um, so it was really interesting to watch um, that I wasn't able to get any uh, closer to them when they were doing that, um, but, but it was really um, enjoyable to watch. Okay, this is the last place that we stayed. Um, it was the AIB Lodge. And um, the reason that I have this photo here is, again, this it was um, the sun was starting to go down, which is why the nice light is on here. And you can see like these kinds of rocks were just all over the place. Um, and uh, as I said, I was just fascinated by seeing um, these kinds of rocks. Okay, so I've um, given you an overview of what things are and then just a couple of minutes on where we stayed in some food and then we can take some questions. So Windhoek, we stayed at Galton House. Um, I was actually there three different times, start, middle, um, and end. So this is my room. I, I tend to take photos of the bedrooms for reasons that I can't explain. Um, this was in Swakamund. The um, hotel was called The Delight. It was a really beautiful place. And I loved it because it had this cute little red refrigerator. And anyone who knows me knows I love red. I wanted to bring it home. That wasn't practical. But um, so that was uh, what that looked like. 
this was um, France and Ndongo Lounge, um, Lodge, sorry. This is where we stayed when we did that first game hunt um, where we saw the giraffes. And some of the group went out the next day and got to see rhinoceros, so I didn't go out with them. This was um, a guest farm. We stayed there um, just one night and um, it's a third generation farm, um, cattle and sheep. And this, the couple have turned this into a guest house. So it's still a working farm trying to make some money because there had been a drought when we were there in March, there'd been a drought going on for three years and um, people were trying to sell their animals um, and selling them for next to nothing. And the reason they were trying to sell them was they couldn't feed the cows and sheep. Um, generally, if, if there's not a drought, they don't need to like feed the cows and sheep. Um, they're grazers, they can find water, everything goes fine, but once it's drought. And so this farmer was telling us how he was going to um, get rid of in the fall, so by now, um, all of um, the adult cows and just keep the very young cows because they didn't need to eat so much and they would be able to manage. Um, this was a country lodge that we stayed at um, and in, in Keoka land. We didn't really like this place or I didn't. This is the one that was closest to, um, no, 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 no. This one, this was fine. It's this, th this was fine. Um, just one of the places we stayed in Apu. This lodge, this is the one closest to Angola. And it had, it was really hot there and it had swamp coolers. And we all decided swamp coolers um, do not cool anything. Um, and some of them didn't even work. So that was probably our least favorite place to stay. Uh, this is Camp Doro. Um, this is my tent, room for two people. Um, there was really only room for me. It's really teeny tiny. Um, and the back here was a working shower, a really wonderful shower and a sink and a, and a toilet and things. Really nice luxury um, thing. And then this is LA, but, and here's the rocks I was talking about. Um, this is a really nice lodge, um, and really big rooms here. Um, so those were some of the places that we stayed. Um, some food, just to give you, so this was all food that we had at Camp Doro. And they really worked hard at plating things. Every place we went had beautiful plating. And I often would think, where did they learn this plating? But they must watch the same cooking shows we do. So an omelet, a fruit uh, tray that was just beautiful. I think these are both fish dishes. This is a custard. And this, I think, was an e eggplant kind of salad thing. Um, most of the food comes in from Windhoek and is, is shipped in um, every day. This is other food that um, we ate. This gin and tonic. Um, we had uh, gin tasting one day, and the, they're just beautiful the way they make their gin and tonics. There was cucumbers, and there were strawberries, and there were blueberries, and um, an orange slice, and it was really tasty and really beautiful. This was one of our um, picnic lunches um, out in the field, and so there were. This was the elephant day. There was pasta salad, uh, chicken cutlets, fish cutlets. I think there was hummus and some other things. Um, and then there are just some fish and risotto dishes. This, um, sorry that these aren't the right size. I was trying to do something and I couldn't figure out how to do it. So this was um, one of the restaurants that we ate in, in um, Windhoek. And these are all the kinds of game um, that they had on the menu. I didn't try, I, I'm a pescatarian, so I didn't try any of the game. Part of me regrets that in a, a little bit. It's like, well, I could have tasted something probably. This was um, the written menu in our in the camp um, of what they were going to make that day, all the food for lunch that they were going to pack out for us and dinner. Um, but the big note was Nancy, pescatarian. So they were all supposed to remember that. Um, and when I introduced myself, that was the first thing. Oh, you're the pescatarian. So that was kind of funny. So I think that's it. So I'm going to turn off the screen sharing. So thank you so much, Nancy, for a very interesting uh, experience and presentation. I I um, have a question. You're sitting in some of these camps, seem to be out in nowhere. <laughs> how how uh, safe is it to walk around outside the camp on these trails or whatever if you wanted to go for a stroll? Is that considered safe or the animals that you have to be aware of? <sighs> Well, I, I didn't really try to do that. And in, in the luxury camp that I showed you in, I mean, we had flashlights, 
Um, and if you forgot to bring your flashlight to dinner, they brought them to you. Um, but it, it was more, there weren't, we weren't afraid of animals in, in that camp, but you could trip on rocks. So, so you didn't want to do that. Um, in the camp that was near Angola, um, there were no animals in the camp. I think that would have been safe enough to, to wander around. Um, there aren't any villages or towns, so you don't have to worry about people. And I'm not suggesting that you thought we would, but yeah, I would say it was relatively safe, but you had to pay attention because of the awkwardness of the ground more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, the food that the, you have there, was it safe to eat everything? It was absolutely safe to eat everything. Um, and I, I have a pretty weak stomach and I wasn't sick once, which was good. Um, everything was really well cleaned. Uh, the, the water is, is filtered. So, I mean, I had salads. I had lots of salads, mostly lived on salads and fish um, and some fruit and um, no issues at all. Good. The food was excellent. Throughout, the food was excellent. Any questions from anyone else or comment or the people who've been to Namibia who would like to add to what Nancy uh, experienced? Or any of your friends who are on the line, Nancy, who were on the same trip with you? Did they have... Yeah, I, I hope they say something. Speak up. <laughs> okay, I'll speak. Oh. Hi, Marvin. Hi. I, I actually think she was extremely accurate and described very well. Uh, the whole trip, it it was quite an adventure, and uh, it, it's if you have not been in Namibia, I will say it's it's one of the best places I've been in my life. So I will highly recommend to go there, and I love the presentation. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I missed the beginning of the presentation. Is there any chance it replays? <laughs> Uh, yes, the the presentation is being recorded and it will be shared with all the members of the travel group and it also will end up if Nancy agrees to be on the YouTube website of the Emeritus College. Thank you. Um, someone with a hand up, it says iPad Joan 968130. You have to unmute. You need to unmute. Good. Here I am. <laughs> um, this was very interesting because I just came back as well from South Africa and it's my second trip. The first time uh, we did the garden route all around the bottom of the continent and started, um, well, I actually went to um, a benefit and I got a silent auction item. Would you believe it was 10 days in one of these safari camps for two people for $2,000? American. It was unbelievable. Anyway, um, that was, uh, they're really not safaris. They're game farms because all over South Africa, all over Africa, the animals could just roam. But now that it's fenced, they don't want their animals getting inbred. So there are loads and loads and loads of these places that are basically game management places. And they, they're, they're breeding the animals and they're tracking everything so that the animals remain healthy and not inbred. And then I went with the same guide again, and I did not get him off the internet. I got him privately, and he's very reasonable, and he prefers to take just a couple or or and, and not have 10 people. And we were just came back from being, we flew to Johannesburg, then we went to Botswana, and we were in Botswana and uh, Namibia, and we went to Zimbabwe to the falls as well. And we had a very interesting talk and I would be happy to present because my experience was very different. What I appreciated about this one is it focused on the people. And that was really interesting to me. Yes, thank so, you. yeah, I, I really appreciated that. Um, and my two trips I have documented and I'd be happy to present. So just That's I'm new. Fantastic. I'm new to the group. So. So, 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 Joan, all you need to do is to send me an email. You should have my email address from the email that I sent out to everyone, mm -hmm. Paul Steinbach, just send me an email and let me know what you'd like to talk about and we can talk about which uh, day it works for you. Sure, that would be great. It's because this is really interesting because everybody's experiences are really very different. Exactly. Yeah. So as I've said before to people, uh, 
it is quite acceptable to present on a topic that has been presented before a place that's been, pre been presented by someone else before, because as you say, everybody's experience is going to be different and our perspectives are different, so it could be of interest. Any other questions, comments? It was, it was excellent. Thank you. So, as usual, Nancy, uh, the photography is uh, very good. We know that. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Paul. Um, before we uh, quit, to let you know that our next uh, meeting uh, is going to have a presentation by Richard Stokes on India, and that will be on October the 14th. Um, and I think Richard is here somewhere. I don't know if you want to say anything more at this time. We're... we're uh, yeah, it's going to be November the 14th. Well, it's November the 14th. Sorry, November the 14th. It's already past October the 14th. You're right. Otherwise, I've missed it. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's November the 14th, and that will be the last uh, presentation for the year for 2024, and then we'll be into January. And in January, we well, haven't fixed the date yet, but I'm going to talk about uh, our experience in traveling to Morocco also in March, uh, when Nancy was in Namibia, that's where we were. Okay. But thank you everybody for coming, Nancy. This was, I think, one of the most well-attended presentations we've ever had. Uh, so everybody was interested in this part of the world and perhaps also interested in hearing you again. So thank you very much. Thanks, Richard Paul. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm.